This episode of the podcast is brought to you by our friends at Regrow. Hey, cannabis operators, got a couple questions for you. Are your SOPs tied directly to your cultivation plans? Can you easily manage your inventory and workforce and vendors from a single system? Can you manage compliance across multiple licenses and states? Do you have performance analytics to help you maximize your 24-month cultivation and manufacturing plans? If this is not the case, Regrow is there to help. They can help you maximize your yields and consistency. Think of Regrow as the single pane of glass view into your entire supply chain. They're available globally with native localization and foreign language support. So if you're a cannabis company searching for a strategic business partner to help you automate your business, scale effectively, and make the supply chain work for you, you can find Regrow at regrow.io. That's regrow.io. Regrow, the premier cloud-based cannabis supply chain management system. Walter, what's going on, man? Hey, Kevin, how are you? I'm doing well. We were just talking before we started recording. It's Friday, and is there any other better feeling than a long, busy week? And, uh, you know, Friday late afternoon is rolling around, although the work never stops with you, right? Yeah, you know, uh, it turns out there's a trade show tomorrow at McCormick Place here in Chicago, so I'm getting suckered into uh, going down to that and, uh, and you know, work in the crowd. <laughs> Oh, man. And those are even more exhausting. I, and I hate to, you know, kind of make it worse than what it, you might be already experiencing. But I mean, it's it's networking, right? So you got to be on, you're shaking hands, you're so like there's literally no no rest. But um, they're important to be at, right? Because that's really where you're meeting everyone in the industry. And there's that opportunity for face to face. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we kind of have this, this mantra at uh, our company that you know, we're lowering the barrier to entry. We're disrupting the existing paradigm. But you don't do that if you don't build a network that is on board and wants to come along for the ride. That's absolutely right. I mean, and now is the time to build that network with, you know, the cannabis industry being so um, early in its stages. So, Walter, let's get a sense uh, about you and your background. I can see here you're the co-founder, CEO, and CTO of cognitive harmony technologies. So you're wearing a lot of hats there, but I know that your background is uh, you're an accomplished software ar- architect, financial engineer, and entrepreneur. So tell us about you know your your background um, on the professional side and what led you to uh, cannabis and where you're at today. Sure. Yeah. Um, and please interrupt me if if it starts dragging on too long. No. But, um, the uh, I got into cannabis officially, you know, legally, uh, three years ago. And, um, it, prior to that, you know, I, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I wasn't a super accomplished, in, you know, student, like in high school and, and in my early years. Um, and, uh, I was a bike mechanic, snow, a snowboard, uh, guy. And we were doing a lot of, uh, that scene, you know, hiking mountains, and, you know, weed culture was a having, very, having fun is what you're yeah. <laughs> the, the weed culture permeated the space that I operated in. And um, I was also a you know home grower back then and uh, ended up actually getting busted for growing weed in my basement when I was in my early 20s. And um, it was it was really sort of a turning point for me in the sense that up until that point, you know, nobody from our family had had really gone to college, had done anything uh, professionally to, to mark out a career for themselves. And at that point, I decided to um, switch trajectories and, and really focus on my career. Um, I went through a, you know, an experimental phase trying to figure out you know, which track was aligned with the way that my brain works. But um, it turned out that I was really interested in math and physics. And, uh, and so I, I ended up entering a, uh, theoretical physics and applied math program. It, t- it turns out that you were just into math and physics. Yeah, it turns like, out. Like, how did, I, <laughs> how did that happen? I, I was not a performer in math um, in high school, but um, you, you know, it, it. What? It's funny because I originally like uh, went to when I enrolled in college after getting busted. I decided, I was a music major. Right? I'm a guitar player. I play mandolin, piano, and a few other instruments. And um, I was really interested in music. And I, but when I get interested in something, I go down the rabbit hole. 
all the way at the bottom, you know? And, um, and that, so the, the math of music is really what got me interested in math to begin with. And once I was interested, I started excelling. What type of music were you studying when you got interested in math? Uh, you know, everything from jazz, classical, uh, prog rock, um, yeah, even, you know, I mean, growing up as a kid of the 90s in the Pacific Northwest, everybody was into the, you know, the grunge scene early <laughs> on. And then that kind of evolved into the... Um, the other music, but definitely experimental music or um, improvisational stuff. And, and you know, I, I saw these like mathematical structures. I wanted to understand how they worked in music. And ultimately, I realized that it's physics. And in order to understand physics, you got to understand math. Um, and uh, so I, I learned it and, and ended up pursuing uh, a, you know, a, a bachelor's degree in, in these subjects. In order to do that, I moved to Chicago because um, they were like found the one school that would take me since I almost flunked out of high school, <laughs> you know. And uh, and I I, um, I actually met this guy who was like the other weird dude in the undergraduate physics program who was like you know five ten years older than everybody else, and, <laughs> and you know like oh hey there's like a turns out obviously we both you know were. Uh, connoisseurs of of cannabis and um you know he was a an ex-rave dj from houston who also got into physics you know from a weird uh <laughs> an alternate tra track right and um and so you know in in going through that program i learned that you know you apply yourself you find an interest in something you can pretty much accomplish whatever you want um but and and i actually i, I, I took a short stint in trying to take that further into like a PhD level physics. And I, I was looking at the five to seven years it was going to take to pull off that. Right. Yeah. Looking at the market in Chicago at the time and all these, um, I, I saw everybody getting a master's degree in finance or business and, and starting to make some money. So um, I, I got into a, a business school for financial engineering and started doing like modeling of, uh, you know, stock option futures prices and, and um, got, got started working for a firm that focused on proprietary trading, which means trading their own money. Right. <laughs> um, and so they'd hire uh, what they call quants or financial engineers like me to take their ideas and automate them and trade in the market. And, uh, and so you know, I, I did that for a number of years. Is that, so I just learned the term because I'm, I watch like Bloomberg, I have it in the background every mm -hmm. day as I work and they, you know, they talk often about quantitative tightening and, and what the Fed's doing right now. I mean, quantitative easing, is that part of like what you're talking sure. about in terms of the algorithm and? Yeah, there's all sorts of algorithms. Like there's time domain algorithms that look at, you know, the future, the curves of the markets in the future and how, um, interest rates impact the shape of those curves, and and um, then there is you know, market making, which is more um, high frequencies. You know, how quickly can you react to market information and, and execute an order? Um, and and we did both. I actually ended up uh, working. We got acquired by this firm that focused on uh, these big, definitely the opposite of high frequency trading. Even though that's what I did for the first few years of my career. Um, there are these like big agricultural firms that they have a million hectare acres of corn or something, and they'd want to lock in a price above today's market price, and um, they would be willing to bet on it. And so the company I worked at, we would synthesize that in the markets and then take the spread. Um, so it was, uh, and, and, you know, that, that was a good gig, but in the end, I realized, you know, it wasn't fulfilling, you know, and, <laughs> right. and I it was really just money making money holders more money right right and um and so i got out of that i, I, I did some how, how long did you do that for uh we were i was there for five plus years okay uh, work, working on that subject and then um ended up in a small startup where we were focused more on um, uh, some cryptocurrency stuff and um you know doing ethereum mining and and uh, trading cryptocurrencies on multiple exchanges early on in the crypto game and uh, wow. I did that for a few years and then went into ad tech because, uh, you know, it's kind of like you follow the, the paycheck, right, from, from one industry to the other who is for sure, who's paying yeah. engineers the, the best right now. And um, in ad tech, though, 
you know, previous to that, I, I focused on these problems that were like, um, you know, siloed into the, the back end of these server environments where it's just directly talking to exchange, not like the real internet. And when I got into ad tech, I learned about how the real internet works and, you know, tracking and click tracking and audience um, identification and, um, you know, all of the things that, that uh, make money on the internet. Um, and, right. and that for me um, was very fascinating because it, it, I learned how crazy the, the internet really is. It's Tell us about it. it. Yeah, it's amazing that it works. Every every topic that every like career that you've been in right now, I'm like, okay, I want to dive into like all that and learn about it. I mean, so I'm going to pause you here for this one, especially. Sure. Let's yeah. talk about tracking. Let's talk about some of the big like wow moments you had, big surprises in that role, and what you learned about the internet. And uh, you know. yeah, the first thing I learned is that um, you know the the business of tracking is heavily you know it's like a battleground between big money interests right you've got your apples your facebook's your your big uh data silos right that their their main interest is in maintaining the the data silo so they can monetize it uh and to their own internal maximal benefit um and then there's the rest of the internet that they're trying to kill and so that they can, you know, uh, continue to have a monopoly on uh, user data. And so, you know, my role was in that sort of outside of the data silos, making the rest of the, the web still monetizable through, you know, click tracking and, um, you know, real-time bidding uh, and, and working kind of the full stack from the demands, the supply side to the demand side in the audience space, right? Cause, and every audience has kind of a market to it. And mm -hmm. there's hundreds of players that are bidding on that market every time a, a website opens. And it was my job to make sure, you know, that we could attribute that activity and, and trace it back to individual users. And, um, you know, if you look at what most of the big players are doing in the space, it's all about personal privacy, which cuts out that side of the, mm -hmm. of the right. audience. Uh, the you know ad tech market and and kind of reinforces that monopoly that you see in on uh, in the in the data silos like apple facebook instagram TikTok, whatever right um and so you know i saw kind of first of all the writing on the wall the, the death of third-party cookies and and the death of um you know legacy tracking measures really mean that it's a consolidation of power among you know the, the the big players and you know, google's the biggest among them uh in in this respect because they they really control the market for um you know like uh search right and um and by by forcing everybody to go through their servers they basically get everybody's data and um you know i, I kind of ran into the same problem i started I, i'm thinking like this is a lot like finance. It's big money, protecting big money interests. And I'm just a tool in that machine um, that as an engineer, I'm looking for something more fulfilling. And it was right about when I'm starting to, to have that internal conversation in my head that they legalized uh, adult use cannabis. Here. Are you are you consuming at that time? Like while you yeah, have sure. jobs? Look, yeah. in, in every white collar job I've ever worked at, there's like the contingent of people who consume cannabis and they all identify them each other within like their first week of, of employment. Right? You are, and, you are so <laughs> right, man. Like one of my good, good friends today, uh, we met like working together and one night after a happy hour, we all like me and a few others smoked, uh, and ever since, like, it was a whole, like, you know, you're kind of on the same page, the same wavelength at that point. I mean, he was in my wedding, you know, and the, another friend at the same job attended as well. So it's like lifelong nice. kind of connections that you make. I, I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, there is also, um, I, I, I have, uh, for me, and I, I have a, a medical card here in Illinois, but for me, you know, cannabis really allows me as someone who has uh, a you know, I will like you throw a ball I'll just start chasing it, right? Because <laughs> I can, I, I, I'm so good at like switch tasking, but it's also kind of a um, disability at the same time. So for me, working as an engineer, uh, cannabis allowed me to focus my 
my energy and attention into a problem for extremely long periods of time and perform at a level uh, quite high in amongst my peers. And, you know, I, I tended to be pushed towards management as a result. Um, and, you know, I, most of the time you're working for somebody you can't even really explain that to. Right. Uh, but, you know, I, I worked that dynamic for, for a number of years. And, yeah. Uh, and, I, yeah. I have too. I mean, no, I, I can totally relate. And, um, you know, I, before we get into the, the, the transition, because I know that's mm -hmm. kind of where you're going next, I, I, I do want to point out one thing that I find fascinating in your story. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, you know, you, you talked about your upbringing and how, you were just a kid that was, you know, smoking and, and snowboarding and you got into some trouble, but you decided at some point that I'm going to make the switch. I'm going to be, I'm going to focus on my career. And there's so many people out there, I think today with, with mental health issues and, and mental health concerns that they feel like they can't progress, right? Some people feel like, Hey, this is my situation. I can't like, this is just what it is. So let's talk about your mindset in that process. Like how, what did you have to do mentally? Because obviously you're accomplished at this point. I mean, you've worked for big firms, big companies, and you've learned a lot in that process. And it's, and it's actually all self-taught, right? I mean, for the most part. Yeah. So how, how did you make the switch? What'd you do? Um, I, I, you mean initially early on, right? Initially early on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah when you decided to make um, that life change. Yeah. So the, the first thing was I had a kind of an eye-opening experience when I got busted. Um, the, at the time I, I worked at this bike shop on the north side of Spokane, Washington, which, um, and, and my boss was renting me the house that I was growing and he didn't know I was growing. Uh, and when I got busted, I had the most humbling experience of my life where I had to, you know, after I got out of jail, I went straight up to his house and I had to tell him what happened. Right. Right. And how the, the, the police had come in and just ransacked the house. And, and, um, you know, uh, it was, it was a humbling experience and it was even more humbling his reaction. Like I was, I was sure I was going to get fired and kick me out of this house. And I, you know, I was, I was just ready for it all. Right. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, he, the way he responded to me was so, um, just humbling and, um, understanding that and I didn't deserve it right I had done something that jeopardized this guy's house and and uh you know and it jeopardized his business because I was working for him at the time and, right. and um and so you know to me it was like I know I have something to offer and the, the world that is you know I'm not going to say beyond being a bike mechanic because I continue to be a bike mechanic for the next 10 years you know putting myself through college but um but that, you know, my interests, I knew that if I pursued my interests that I, I can perform and that I will be successful. Right. And, and that's something I always heard from my mom, even though she wasn't like, you know, encouraging me to go to college. Right. She always told me I could always accomplish whatever I put my mind to because she knew me. And, um, you know, even though we didn't grow up with a lot of resources, my, my sister and I joke all the time that we grew up, um, like we would go to the sledding hill and because we didn't have any money, we got our, our uh, snow suits from like the, the clothing bank and they said sample right on the ass of them, <laughs> right? In big white letters. <laughs> and, and so we were, you know, it was like- It's like a big target that everybody can see, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> big target to get me thrown up by all the other kids. <laughs> the thing. But, um, but yeah, you know, I, I looked at, at uh, just the world of opportunity that was out there. And I, and, you know, my, my boss and landlord giving me a second chance meant I had to do something with it. Right. And right. You know, I, I feel like in some ways I've spent every, you know, my life since then trying to do the most with it that I could. Yeah. That's beautiful, man. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's so important for people to hear. And it's amazing. You, you believed in yourself, right? You, you got that second chance. You got that grace from others and you didn't squander it, you know, like, like some people do. Um, well, that's not totally true. I, I think it's important to, for anybody who knows, especially if you're getting into business, it's even more so getting into the cannabis business, that it's about your ability to 
get back up from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. And because I made a million more of them since then. And, um, and get back up on your feet and, you know, take what you can from that experience and, and build upon it. And, and, you know, in cannabis, it's, uh, especially if you're getting into the plant touching side work and licensing, it's like, really tenacity is, is what makes or breaks you. That's a really good point. I mean, like to, to your point, I mean, what you said in business, especially in cannabis failure is going to happen. Right. And so overcoming adversity and just, you know, st- sticking with it is, is important. And so is that, you know, I think this is a good segue. Is that kind of what you experienced? Um, you know, as we go back to your transition into cannabis after finally leaving um, the ad tech space? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, my, my business partner, Charles and I, we were at his house. I think uh, it was like a, a French holiday. He was having a little party and um, we were talking about adult, use being passed, uh, legalized here in, in Illinois. And, you know, I said, Hey, let's read the law and figure this, figure this thing out. We're both smart dudes. We can put together a cannabis license application. Nice. We, might even, we might even win. Um, you know, we, I think we both have an, uh, something to bring to the industry. And, um, you know, that was three years ago and, um, we had no idea what we were in for with the state of <laughs> Illinois with, uh, you know, the, the agency that is doing all this, did all the scoring in, in Illinois, KPMG, you know, uh, working through the process here for three years and just starting to get uh, licensed has, has showed me I had no idea what I didn't know, first of all. And um, it was also the impetus for building the, the CHT product because you know, we, we were running into all of the, the same problems that every potential you know, uh, applicant that is trying to get into the business is running into. Um, we knew a lot about cannabis. We knew a lot, I knew a lot about business. My, my partner, Charles, he is a theoretical physicist and, you know, he's done a lot of grant writing and, and which are you know, very complicated documents for, for obtaining funding for um, scientific research. Um, we've, we've, we both had a lot of experience and we filled out our team and we spent the next year just suffering, trying to jump through every hoop that the state would put in front of us. You know, they came back five times with deficiency rounds on our retail applications. They came back uh, four times with deficiency rounds on our craft grow application. Um, it was, it, it was really a nightmare. And what? What was causing that? I mean, you got, like you said, you're smart guys, right? Mm-hmm. So like, we're, and you're, they were throwing you for a loop. So were just regulations or rules changing in real time yeah. as you were applying or? Well, that, it, that was true. Um, so it's a moving target because, uh, you know, there are resolutions and, and changes in, in just the rule set. Then there is the intangible thing that is, you know, the laws are written by lobbyists. Lobbyists are paid by big money in order to secure their own interests. And you have the state on one side making these uh, social equity and, uh, and, and similar uh, promises to, the, to their, uh, the, the residents of their state. And then, you, and then on the other hand, you have them looking to, you know, the big multi-state operators to help them write the laws. <laughs> And the, the, the multi-state operators lock it in for themselves, right? And so, you know, you know, what we found is that there's a lot of needles in haystacks that uh, were very difficult to identify to begin with. The state would come back and say, this document needs something, but they wouldn't give you any other information. And so you're trying to, you know, you're going through the statutes and the rule sets and, and checking checklists. And I, as an engineer, I started looking at this problem. I'm like, oh man, you know, Oh, we should be able to automate this and, and figure out what more easily what's wrong with our with going our going right to the solution. Like, yeah. how do I fix this broken problem? <laughs> yeah, and and so I built some um, some text processing stuff on on AWS that would take the PDFs we had created and search them for all the the citations and things that we needed in order you know that we knew we needed, and then give us a, a, a score report. And we ran that on our apps and we ran that, we, we allowed uh, 
number of other groups to use this as well to improve their applications. And we ended up helping a bunch of groups get perfect scores on their applications, including ourselves by, by taking this approach. And how long did it take you to build that? Um, so I, I would say better part of three months. Wow. Um, but after the second deficiency round that we got back, I, I, I could see that these were going to keep coming mm -hmm. and this was going to be a common problem. Um, and, and we, you know, it, it, it worked. We, we ended up getting into the Illinois lottery, which had, you know, a lot of perfect scoring applicants in it. Um, the other piece of this that's very interesting is the, the way the Illinois lottery was built, it was really uh, set up for those who could put many, buy many tickets. It costs you $2,500 to apply if you're a social equity applicant. Mm -hmm. um, and you were only limited to the number of licenses available in your region. So for the Chicago area, there were 47 licenses on the table. It means you could apply 47 times if you had 47 times $2,500 to throw at the problem. And we did a little statistical modeling and found out that would essentially guarantee you, you know, four or five wins. And if you look at the, you know, the, the value of these licenses once they've been achieved in a market like Chicago. Oh yeah. The ROI on that play, if, if you can identify it, is great. Right. I mean, and if, especially if you're a big MSO who has the capital to, to apply for mm -hmm. every single one and throw $2,500 out, isn't it so funny that like this, these states, and it's not just Illinois, like they speak about social equity yet, like, you know, the minorities that they're trying to serve like, don't even have a shot with some of no. the regulations and, you know, just the, the entrance to get in because it's so cost costly. Well, and, and even once they win, the big secret is, you know, uh, the MSOs come in, right? And they start making these offers that look like big money offers. But, you know, there's all these strings attached on the back end. And, and uh, you know, so many, I've heard so many stories about people who did these deals after they won and still made no money because of the accounting uh, and, and the, the way the taxes are booked against the, uh, the original equity holders or whatever the, the, um, the strategy was in there to still maximize the, uh, the profits for the investor yeah, right. the M, the, that's on the MSL side. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting uh, dynamic there. And, and you know, we, we, we looked at that and said, okay, the real problem is the state puts this, this $150,000 gap between the people that have been impacted, the war on the uh, impacted by the war on drugs, who they say they want to you know, get into the industry. Right. And, and the reality of what it costs to hire a consultant to build this app for you, <laughs> and, um, and which is what the, the well-funded uh, competitors do. And so we said, you know, most of what the, the expensive consultants are doing is putting a bunch of money into writing the app once, and then they're going in and they're, and they're copying and pasting and swapping out names and yep. places and, and they even make mistakes, right? Yep. And that's, that's also an automation problem. So we took our experience in, in uh, scoring our own applications in, in the early parts of Illinois. And we, and we took this realization that there is this gap that needs to be bridged in order to really make the distribution of license holders look like the distribution of people who are impacted by the war on drugs. And we built the bridge and it's called CHT. Wow. 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 So what was your customer base look like when you first launched? I mean, was it, was it started? Well, we, just, we just literally launched this week in New oh, York. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. We just launched. I mean, I spent the last uh, year, 18 months building this. Oh, um, wow. Well, congratulations. That's yeah, huge. Yeah. Yeah. And the reception we got in New York, uh, we were at the, the CWCB Expo in, yeah. uh, in New York last week. Reception was amazing. We've basically got more leads and contacts than we have you know, time to follow up on in the next two weeks. So we're just you know, uh, loading up resources to, to make sure everybody can get in, get signed up and, and start taking advantage of, of what we're doing. Yeah, you're going to know this world quite a bit. I mean, I, I know from a high level because I, you know, I, I tried launching a startup with a, an app and all that kind of stuff. And, and you always got to plan for scale, right? So, I mean, I, I'm sure that's one thing that 
you're kind of alluding to, right? Is like, as you, you want to serve these different customers, you want to make sure that the, the system can handle it and there's enough storage capacity and so on, right? Yeah. Yeah. We've got like really three main areas of the platform that we have to consider scaling. Uh, one is there's an educational component to what we're doing. So we have Greenflower Media in there, which is like one of the, the biggest uh, educational vendors uh, in the in the cannabis industry usually though they're only accessible if you work for a dispensary or something and they'll, they'll do the training for the employees there we got them in um, you know to provide these learning paths for our users and that uh, scales you know based on their infrastructure so we're kind of you know we're, we're collaborating with them to make sure that that scales and then um, on uh, the the main core component of our, our system is, is really based on checklists. And one of the kind of dumb revelations that, that we finally came to is the number one reason people fail to get licensed is because they can't complete the app. Oh, um, I believe that 100%. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's really about having a perfect checklist before you start putting your app together. And so our entire infrastructure is based on checklists that um, you know it, it essentially interview the applicant and then generate other checklists as, as a result. And that, that works to automate the walking through the application. Now, you, there's still places where you're gonna need subject matter experts. There's still going to be you know, corner cases where you need you know, a lawyer, an architect, uh, you know, somebody to do your security plans. There's, there's many things that, you know, we still need expertise in. And so what we've done is embedded those services into the platform through consulting uh, booking. So, you know, just like, um, you know, anybody who wants to book services anymore, you click on the, the um, service tool and uh, book a consulting session and it, it logs a Google Meet in your calendar and, and in mine or in one of our, our consultants. And they're set up for their hour session to, you know, review part of the app or, or get um, some advice on, on how to structure something correctly. So that's the third piece. We've also got, you know, scalability there as well. That makes so much sense, man. I mean, the checklist, right? I mean, a lot of this stuff can be very complicated if you're not familiar with it. I mean, if you're a retail owner, you're not going to know the ins and outs of the legalities and, and regulations unless you're super looking into it. Right. So if you're at a high level, just trying to fill out an application, some of that stuff can be intimidating and can be a, a bit overwhelming. So it, the fact that you could have a checklist that provides step-by-step -step guidance as to what to do first, what to do next, that's amazing. And then not only that, I, I love the fact that you've embedded, you know, those specialty services that, um, wouldn't otherwise be there, right? I mean, that would be on the the end user to have to go find those people, yeah. vet vet them, filter. So that's why did... we go. That's why we go to the trade shows, right? Because we're building a network that our users can tap into. And that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So, like, how do you how do you find these experts? I mean, so it's it's mostly networking, trade shows, like finding these people and learning more about you know their value add or yeah, yeah, and and you know. Like, like I was mentioning earlier, we, we do have a, a dispensary and, and craft cooperation here in Illinois that, um, you know, as, a, as another business, I'm getting up and running. I'm, I'm using them as an interview opportunity to try to bring people in. When we go to the trade shows, you know, it's actually really um, difficult to have time to go out and look around because our booth people are like, I want to, you know, how do I get in? How do I, how do I work with you guys? How do I get my network connected with your network because they see the power of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, those checklists, they have um, a document generation component to them. So the answers that a, the user puts into the checklist generate the documents, the so standard operating procedures, the business plans, and, and the things that have already been kind of handcrafted for the state's uh, asks, and each state is different. Um, you know, those documents are generated so that the user just has to download a zip at the end of the process. And then they, can, they have all the files in to drag and drop into the state portal to apply. Um, so, you know, but in that process, yeah, we're, we're 
referring out to, you know, every kind of service provider you can imagine. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. And I, I actually, I'll admit, I went on your site and y'all have my uh, contact information now. So I'm sure I'm going to get emails, but I, I was curious because I wanted to check out that business plan. Uh, so I haven't looked at it yet. I think it's been emailed to me, but as I was going through that, I noticed the three states for which that business plan was offered, New Jersey, New York, Illinois, are those the three states that you currently operate in right now or are there others? Yeah. So, um, really our focus right now is on, well, I know you launched, so I mean, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Like, are you targeting yeah. those states? Our, our focus is on New Jersey and New York right now, because that's where all the need is. Um, Illinois next round will be a little bit different. Um, and we will, we will be in Illinois, but we're really going where, first of all, there's gotta be a social equity component to the law. Um, if you look at what happened in Connecticut, it was just a free for all. The, the big players could apply as many times as they want. Um, that's not a, uh, that's not a place where we're interested in going in and, and, uh, you know, because there's, we can't execute our mission. Our mission is in the next 10 years to transfer a billion dollars of wealth from, you know, into the communities that have been impacted on the war on drugs by bringing them into the industry as, as equity holders. Um, and, and so, you know, place every competitive big market, Florida will probably be in there. Um, uh, Indiana, I'm assuming, you know, they're, they're going to have to have some sort of social aspect, social justice aspect to their legislation in order to be taken seriously by the, by the people that live in those, uh, in those jurisdictions. Uh, and, and this whole conversation of going state by state is kind of only part of the picture. I mean, our, our, bigger plan, our bigger strategy is these things get replicated, the problems that we're talking about, get replicated at the lo local municipal level. Mm -hmm. And each local municipality has its own process, whether that's an RFP process or uh, an ordinance process where you have to lobby the locals in order to you know, get your application approved there. And depending on how the state legislation was, what was implemented that could need to be done before or after the state level application. And so, you know, we're also looking at the local municipal markets, the big ones, we can't do them all because there's just too many local municipalities. Um, and, uh, you know, federally, we're expecting the next couple of years is going to be federal change. So we'll have a federal program as well in order to, you know, keep people compliant and, and help them apply, uh, top to bottom, you think federal, state, local. Um, and then on a recurring basis, you have renewals, right? Once you're licensed, you have to continue to maintain your license. And that means if anything changes in the law, how do you know where to update your application in order to resubmit it? Um, another similar problem is once you win a license and you're trying to operationalize your business, uh, there's, there's a huge period of time where most of the dispensaries or, or grows, they're going back and reading through the, all the stuff that they submitted to the state because they didn't do it. It wasn't, it wasn't done um, in the way you would normally write a business plan. You first, you looked at the requirements that the state is proposing and backed out of that your, what you're submitting. So by the time you're done, you don't even realize what the promises you made to the state are. So now you get a license, now you're going to reverse engineering your app and figure out how to set up all these systems in order to operationalize your business. Right. And so that's another problem we have our eyes on is now that we have all the data that was used to generate the application, how do we take that and push it into partner systems and, and spin up a operational platform for uh, all of our users once they have won a license. Wow. I mean, I, I know you're, you made a good point because I'm thinking state by state, but you're like, hey, man, pause, hit the brakes for a second. We got local municipalities. We've got, you know, even just the fact of keeping up with renewing licenses, like you said, remaining uh, compliant and whatnot. So th that is a lot of data to take in. And that stuff takes time to, I guess, integrate with the system so that it's automated, right? Yeah, and you know we're we're carefully looking at data partners that can provide uh, well structured data to to drive our platform. A lot of what the data that we operate on right now is is you know generated by us by scraping 
uh, public sources of information and, and uh, incorporate it into our platform. Um, but yeah, my, my broader point, I think, was really uh, wherever there's a social equity play, mm -hmm. we will be there. Um, California and Washington are re-upping uh, their commitment to, to do something about this because they missed they missed the boat in the first part of the uh, industry legalization. New and Mexico has a social equity program as well. You guys should look into that. I yeah. know there'd be a lot of residents in New Mexico that could benefit from, from your platform. Sure. Yeah. yeah, We're looking at everything and it's, we're only limited right now by uh, our bandwidth. You know, we will be growing, we will be growing this year. And um, you know, it, as you, you said, you've done some startup stuff. It's there, there's always uh, you know, MVP value proposition. Yeah. And then there's how do I scale this out to the next level? So we're really right now in the how do I scale this out to the next level phase. Right. And for those that are not familiar, MVP, minimum viable product. So that's just scrappy, right? Get whatever you can out that proves the core competency and then build on that. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's great, man. And I love how you put this all together. I really love y'all's mission, mission statement. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, it's a powerful and impactful. You know, you want to put that those billions of dollars that are going to be generated back into the pockets and, you know, to the people that have been disenfranchised by the plant for so many years. And and that's this technology is putting that into action because there's a lot of lawmakers and, you know, people talking about social equity. but there's one thing to talk about it, but then there's the, okay, well, how do we then do it? How do we implement this? And this is the, you know, one of the first conversations that I've really heard where someone is thinking about this and tackling it, you know, it's, it's a main focus. And so you've really reinforced how technology can lead to a more equitable industry. And I appreciate you sharing that. Oh yeah. You're welcome. And, and you're spot on. I mean, that is exactly, you know, I identified with, the social equity mission of the state when they passed the the laws here in Illinois because I had been impacted by the war on drugs, right. you know, and, and it it pains me to go in to you know I, I've sat down at you know board meeting tables with some big executives in this city anyway uh, at, at big cannabis companies you know uh, talking about this system that we've made um, and doing other types of deals and you know it pains me to see. How they got into the industry because it was all, you know, pre predetermined. You know, you got hedge fund managers and stuff who who just um, saw the opportunity and good for them for you know for realizing the opportunity and deploying the ideal strategy. But um, at some point in time, we you know there's still two thirds of the the country left that are you know living still in, in without access to uh, adult use cannabis. And so there's still an opportunity to kind of to, to pump the brakes on, on that part of the green wave and, and switch script into something that looks more like, you know, the, the industry I grew up uh, with in, in Washington state and, you know, the, the kind of legacy um, black market culture that has been, you know, essentially uh, totally flushed out of the picture uh, up until now. So uh, I, I do see it changing and, and, uh, and it's looking better and, and we, we just want to play a part in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I think it's great. And I, I agree with you. I mean, everyone should have a, a, a shot at this industry. Right. And we know that the starting line for some people versus others is not the same. It's, it's not, it's not uh, relative. So systems like this, and just talking about it more to put things into action to help these people is really what's going to drive the needle home. And uh, I can't say it again. I mean, I'll say it again, Walter. Like, I really am a big fan of what you guys are doing, man. And uh, I can't wait to just continue to see y'all's progress as you continue forward. And, you know, this is the first week of launch. So I'm sure that there's a lot more exciting things to come. Um, why don't you tell us about what you're looking forward to for the remainder of this year and uh, any closing, you know, thoughts that you have as we wrap up? Yeah, sure. So we're looking forward to, uh, you know, the, the final version of the, the New York law dropping and, and that's essentially going to be the starting gun going off for, for, you know, de developing all the content that we need 
to you ship licenses in uh, or ship applications in, in New York. So that's our that's our primary focus. Um, we're doing pre-sales there for people that want to get in now and kind of lock in a discount. And our prices uh, are you know they're very competitive. We come in at a tenth of the price of the big you know uh, white glove consulting firms. And uh, you know we think we can deliver a higher quality product for through automation. And you know we're we're using we have a, a a bank of reference standard operating procedures and and uh, template material that is second to none in the in the business and we know that they win licenses so um, we are looking to make a big impact in new york um, also uh, new jersey we're we're looking to get into um, a lot of conditional there. So the conditional applications are going to be converting into full applications and we're, we're launching uh, full conversion applications in New Jersey for uh, cultivation, manufacturing and retail. And uh, so trying to get people to come in, check out our, our, our product, experiment with it and get comfortable with us, get on the phone with me uh, or any of the folks on our team and you know, get a feel for who we are and, and how we're gonna help you achieve the licensure that you're looking for and how we're gonna help you after that. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really it. I mean, our focus is not gonna expand beyond those, I mean, those jurisdictions until you know, we've delivered all of our promises there. And then and, and we're going to carefully look at what other opportunities come up after that. But for the next six months, it's going to be New Jersey, New York, and nothing else. Sounds like a solid plan. Where can people get in touch? How can they get a hold of y'all if they want to, uh, you know, to talk to you or just even learn more about cognitive harmony technologies? Absolutely. So uh, come check us out at uh, www.cognitiveharmony.tech. And that is uh, CHT. Is the other the other uh, acronym you'll see floating around? I didn't even mention CHT. If you didn't catch it, is THC backwards? Oh yeah, um, that's right. So it's one of those backronyms. Um, <laughs> so that will help people remember it. THC backwards. That's the company that uh, you want to work with to get your your app done. Um, uh, follow us on LinkedIn. Great place for for cannabis business networking. Um, whether you are an, a potential applicant or somebody who is a, a vendor who has services that, that they want to bring to this applicant pool or have us refer uh, out to you, come talk to me. Um, the, the other places where we post content regularly are YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, those kind of places. But LinkedIn is the big one for us. Let's see, what else do we got? Um, you can... Contact us from from the website. There's a, or you can just log into the platform, and there's a chat widget inside the platform. Uh, open that thing up and start talking to us. We'll we'll answer. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, sounds like a solid plan that you have for the next six months and beyond. And I look forward to you know watching you as you guys progress and evolve in this industry. And we'll be sure to put those links and all the. Uh, contact information in the description box in our YouTube video so that people can find that. So. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. Of course. Yes. Thank you, Walter. And Hey, let's have you again on man, as you guys continue to or start to grow after this launch. Awesome. man. I'm, I'm sure there's, we'll find something else interesting to talk about next time too. Oh yeah. You're a wealth of knowledge, man. I got to look forward to it. Thanks. Thank a, yep. Thanks again. And thank you all for listening. Bye. Have a good one.